Hello and welcome to a video lecture about cat infectious diseases. So these are um, illnesses caused by viruses or bacteria that cause illness in felines. Uh, so to start off with, we're going to talk about the illness feline viral rhinotracheitis. Um, so if you want to use your word parts to pick apart what this illness might be, uh, rhinotracheitis, uh, itis is inflammation of, trache is the trachea, and rhino is the nose. Um, so this is basically an upper respiratory infection for cats. Uh, so it is caused by um, another herpes virus. We talked about a herpes virus um, that causes illness in dogs. And here we have a herpes virus that causes an illness in cats. Um, so uh, what do we know about herpes viruses? Is that they, um, the animals are long-time carriers, right? They are long-term carriers. So that virus will stay dormant in the body and then um, kind of reactivate during times of stress. Uh, so cats that have um, the feline herpes virus, uh, it's the type 1 virus, they tend to have um, chronic cases of upper respiratory. So 50% uh, of upper respiratory tract diseases are caused by this feline herpes virus. Um, F-U-R-T-D stands for Feline Upper Respiratory Tract Disease, and it's basically like a cat cold. Um, this can be caused by a few different agents. So the feline herpes type 1 virus is one. Um, the feline Khaleesi virus is another. And then there's three bacterial causes, Chlamydophila felis, uh, Bordetella bronchoseptica, and mycoplasm. Does that Bordetella one sound familiar? Bordetella causes kennel cough in dogs, and uh, we talked about that it can affect cats as well. Um, so that canine Bordetella vaccine uh, can be used for cats as well to uh, prevent this upper respiratory. The incubation time on um, the feline herpes virus is two to four days. So the time between coming into contact with the virus and showing signs uh, or clinical signs of illness is two to four days. And it is transmitted is exactly how you think an upper respiratory infection would be transmitted. So direct contact with the infected animal, um, aerosolized uh, respiratory secretions, so coughs and sneezes will aerosolize um, the virus, and then fomites as well. So remember that fomites are inanimate objects that, um, that can carry the virus. So clinical disease, how long the cat is sick for, is 14 to 21 days, so two to three weeks. It's fairly long, longish lasting. And the systems affected, uh, the respiratory system, which makes sense, it's a rhinotracheitis, right? The eyes tend to be really watery, um, and the reproductive system as well. So clinical signs of the sick cat, you're gonna see sneezing for sure. That's gonna be one of the most common signs. Uh, you're also gonna see conjunctivitis. So what does that mean? Itis is referring to inflammation of, and conjunctiva, remember, is like the um, pink lining of the tissues around the eye, right? So the conjunctiva. You can also see possible ocular ulcers, uh, so ulcers on the on the eye as well. Uh, we'll see nasal and ocular discharge. Uh, they could be drooling, kind of open mouth breathing, especially if their nose is really clogged. We'll see fever, we'll see anorexia, so they're not eating, and we'll see depression as well. So is it debilitating? It can be severe, um, especially in kittens, um, and it is chronic. So because of the nature of the herpes virus staying dormant in the system, it can get reactivated, uh, especially during stressful times, like maybe moving or getting a new pet or something. Getting a new pet's a pretty common one. So someone will get a new pet and then all of a sudden their cat is sick and they blame the new cat for making their cat sick. Um, but honestly, uh, it uh, very well could be just a flare-up of this herpes virus. 
Uh, how long are they shedding the virus for? Intermittently, uh, but it is for life. So like I said there, it's usually activated in times of stress. So anytime the cat's sick, they're gonna be shedding that virus. So treatment, can we treat a virus? No, we can't cure the virus itself, but we can do supportive treatments. So it's gonna depend on what's going on with the pet. Uh, typically, the virus itself is self-limiting, but if they develop a secondary infection, we may or may not need to add in antibiotics. If they're really anorexic, um, not eating, not drinking, we may need to have them on IV fluids. Um, they may need like special care in terms of like cleaning their faces. So cats that are really sick like this and they got like the crusties around their eyes and their nose and everything, they really like it. Some really nice TLC you can do for them is to just grab a little piece of gauze, make it wet with some warm water and wash their face with it. Um, so it does remind them of um, being taken care of by their mommy, right? When their little mummy cats are licking the, the kitten's faces and it does help them to feel better. Uh, usually these guys as well, I'll rec recommend like at home care for them. Things like, um, like steaming the cat. So bring them into the bathroom with you when you're having a shower. You don't need to bring them into the shower itself, just into the bathroom, have the shower running nice and hot. Get it nice and steamy in there and let that cat breathe in the steam. You can use um, uh, humidifiers as well. It can be help helpful for them as, uh, to kind of help clear out those airways a little bit. Uh, so is there a vaccine for feline viral rhinotracheitis? Yes, and it is a core vaccine. It is the FVR and FVRCP. So just like dogs, the vaccine timeline for kittens is 8, 12, and 16 weeks. Then it's boosted one year later. Um, and then every one to two years, we re-booster the FERCP. Actually, this one might even be up to three years, I thought. Um, so in kittens, okay, so remember the herpes virus in dogs caused fading puppy syndrome. Um, in, the, in cats, it causes fading kitten syndrome and um, very uh, similar kind of um, uh, like progression of illness as the, as the puppy one. Uh, so it is fatal when, when kittens do catch that one. Uh, reoccurrence, uh, de I mean, definitely possible because it's a herpes virus. It's going to keep resurfacing throughout their life. One thing, though, that we can do for um, prevention is that we can give lysine, uh, which is an amino acid, and um, it can help to reduce the herpes virus from replicating in the body. Um, so there are supplements available as well. Uh, for cats that, that you can give them that can help with, um, with chronic upper respiratory like that. Uh, okay, so diagnosis uh, is going to be based on history and clinical signs, um, but it's a little bit of a presumptive de de sorry, diagnosis. We could do a viral culture, but it takes three to four weeks for results. Typically, it's self-limiting at two to three weeks, so by the time you get results, it is cleared up. It might still be good information to have though, because if you know that it is the herpes virus causing this upper respiratory infection, then you know um, that it's possible it could come back and you can be prepared for that. Um, ocular ulcers or eye problems that are non-responsive to antibiotics is a hint um, that it is the feline herpes virus. So in the environment, how long does that virus last? Less than 24 hours. And uh, fortunately for us, sunlight and bleach will kill that virus. Um, and then um, for a prognosis, in kittens up to 70% will die, um, especially Siamese are more prone, um, but adults the prognosis is usually good. They're uncomfortable, but they recover. And then is it zoonotic? No. Uh, okay, so our next, this is another upper respiratory infection. Um, it's called the Khaleesi, um, and it's caused by feline Khaleesi virus, or FCV. 
So incubation on this one is a little bit longer than that two to six days, or sorry, two to four days of the herpes virus. It's two to six days for Khaleesi. Um, Khaleesi is same idea, direct contact with the animal will transmit the virus, um, aerosolized respiratory secretions, and then contact with a fomite or a vector. So remember, fomites are inanimate objects, and then a vector is um, like a living thing that can spread the virus. So guess what the vector might be? People. <laughs> so um, this, uh, we can bring this home to our animals on our clothing. So working in the vet clinic, if you're handling animals that are sick with upper respiratory, you could bring that virus home on your hands or your clothes or your shoes. Um, if you've been hanging out with cats that are sick, or working at a shelter or something, same idea. Uh, so we want to be careful about not bringing those things home to our pets. Uh, clinical disease lasts same as herpes virus, 12 to 21 days. Systems affected, the respiratory system, the mouth, the eyes, and the musculoskeletal system. Um, uh, okay, so sorry, clinical signs. Um, we'll see some slight nasal and ocular discharge, but we are going to see joint and muscle pain, um, possibly a mild loss of appetite. Uh, the one thing that makes this um, more obvious that's Khaleesi virus, we're going to see oral and nasal ulcers and severe drooling along with that. Um, and then it could, if it progresses, it could turn into pneumonia. So there is a theory um, about cats. So cats get these things called resorptive lesions. Um, they are like on uh, kind of like little cavities on their teeth. But basically what happens is they get a small little hole in their enamel and then the enamel starts to eat away. And basically the body reabsorbs the tooth from the outside in. So what eventually happens is that there is no more enamel, there is no more dentin. We just get left with an exposed pulp. Um, if you remember, the inside of the pulp is nerves and blood vessels. So that really hurts. It's really painful for the cats. Um, so there, like some cats get them, some cats don't. Nobody really knows why, but there is a theory that cats that were infected with the Khaleesi virus when they were young um, are more likely to have uh, those resorptive lesions later in life. And that kind of makes sense when um, their mouth is affected as part of the clinical signs of the illness, right? With the oral and nasal ulcers. So I don't know if that's proven necessarily yet, but there's definitely been um, a, a link um, noticed. So is this a debilitating illness? Uh, it's fairly mild. Um, I suppose those resorptive lesions, if that is, um, if that is a proven fact, um, that can be obnoxious, right? They're pre pretty painful later on in life. Uh, virus it, shedding, it can be continuous for weeks, months, and years. Uh, and about half of the infected animals become carriers um, for at least a few months. I mean, sorry, no. Um, yes, most about half or a few months, sorry, and a small percentage become carriers for life. So they um, kind of are continuously shedding this virus. Uh, in terms of treatment, uh, again, can we, can we treat a virus directly? No. So we are gonna offer supportive treatment. Uh, that's gonna look like anti-inflammatories to bring down the inflammation. Uh, it looks like a humidifier, same as with the herpes virus to kind of help open up those airways a bit. Uh, we'd like to keep the animal clean, so give them some TLC and clean them up. And we want to address the appetite issue, so we may need to do some force feeding. If there is pneumonia or another secondary bacterial infection, we're going to need um, antibiotics. But generally, the Khaleesi virus is self-limiting. So assuming that the illness is mild, it's not going to require treatment. Is there a vaccine? Yes, and it is core. It is the C in FERCP. Uh, timeline on that one, same as with um, the herpes virus. 8, 12, and 16 weeks, one year, and then every one to two years. If kittens contract the Khaleesi virus, 
um, and it gets, um, and it's like severe, um, it will turn in, it can turn into a fatal pneumonia and then they will die from that. Recurrence is possible. You can get sick again from Khaleesi. And then uh, diagnosis, how do we diagnose this one? Uh, you know, history, clinical signs, um, physical exam. Again, though, it's gonna be fairly presumptive, but one clear um, distinction between herpes virus and Khaleesi's virus is that those uh, oral and nasal ulcers are present with the Khaleesi virus, and we're not gonna see those really um, with the herpes virus. Herpes, we might see uh, eye ulcers, right? Ocular ulcers, um, but we're not gonna see oral and nasal. Uh, and then we can take an X-ray, which would diagnose the pneumonia. And we could do a viral culture at an outside lab, but again, it takes three to four weeks to get results on that one. Prognosis for kittens. If they develop that pneumonia, the prognosis is poor. Uh, for adult cats, it's um, usually a good prognosis. In the environment, the virus can last eight to 10 days or even possibly longer in a cool and damp location. And bleach and like, you know, accelerated peroxide, all that, those are gonna kill this virus. And is it zoonotic? No. So this is another cause of that um, FURTD, right? Feline upper respiratory tract disease. This is a bacterial cause. So we talked about the two viruses, the feline herpes virus type one, and the feline Khaleesi virus. And now we're gonna talk about one of the three bacterial causes. And this one is Chlamydophila. Uh, this is a bacterial agent and it causes about five to 10% of all of the upper respiratory tract disease cases. Incubation time on this one is longer. It's seven to 10 days. And transmission is direct only. You have to be in direct contact with a sick cat to catch this one. Clinical disease is gonna last 14 or more days and the system affected is the eyes. So clinical signs are gonna be eye things, right? So conjunctivitis, that's like that pink eye. Um, ocular discharge, uh, so you know, leaky eyes. Um, is it debilitating? It's fairly mild. Uh, how long are they shedding? Short term, once it's resolved, they're not shedding um, the bacteria anymore. So treatment, can we treat a bacterial infection? Yes, absolutely. We can treat it directly with antibiotics. Uh, tetracyclines, doxycyclines, those are gonna be our antibiotics of choice for the chlamydophila. Otherwise, we can do supportive treatment. TLC, uh, you know, keep the eyes clean. Cats really do appreciate that. And then vaccine is available, but it is non-core. And then if kittens develop this illness, they, it is possible for them to get a fatal pneumonia. Kittens with upper respiratory infections often turn into fatal pneumonia. Reoccurrence of this one is fairly low. Diagnosis, um, well, you know, as usual, history and clinical signs, right? Uh, we can do some blood work. Blood work's gonna in indicate increased white blood cells because white blood cells increase in the body to fight off infections. So that indicates to us that the body's fighting a bacteria. Uh, we can do a culture and sensitivity, but it's pretty time consuming. And there is a blood test available for Chlamydophila antibodies. Uh, do antibody tests confirm that Chlamydophila is present at the moment? Not necessarily, it just indicates that um, antibodies have been developed because of exposure. So we can't necessarily say for sure that the animal is currently sick with Chlamydophila with an uh, anti antibody test. Uh, prognosis is usually good, um, but it could take a while to return to full normal health. Um, in, ki in kittens, it, it's a poor prognosis if, they have the, if it turns into fatal pneumonia. And then um, in the environment, the bacteria can't survive for any significant period outside of the body. So less than 24 hours outside of the body. And zoonosis is 
possible. It's really low risk, but it is possible for zoonosis. Um, the way to prevent that is to make sure uh, that you're washing your hands really well, good hand hygiene, and making sure you don't have like face-to-face -face contact uh, with cats that are sick with the chlamydophila. Because um, if they're sneezing that uh, or like leaking that eye goo right into your face, you, you can get sick from that. Okay, what's our next one here? Oh, the cat flu. Nice and easy one. Pretty short here. Um, so cats can get the flu and it is caused by the H1N1 virus. Does that sound familiar to anyone? H1N1 was swine flu, um, I don't know, a good, probably like 10 years ago, swine flu was the big flu. Um, so this one is contagious to cats, people, dogs, pigs, and ferrets. Clinical signs can be anywhere between asymptomatic, which means, right, that they do not have any symptoms, to mild to severe. So your young animals, your old animals, and your uh, immunosuppressed animals are going to be more likely to have severe clinical signs. Um, so we'll see your typical kind of flu signs, right? Coughing, sneezing, lethargy, um, so they're very tired, no energy, um, anorexia, they're not eating, nasal and ocular discharge, fever, and dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing. Um, treatment, we can't treat the virus itself, so we're going to do supportive treatment. Um, we may need to do some force feeding, we may need to do some TLC, cleaning up that nasal and ocular discharge. Um, if there's a secondary infection, we may or may not want to introduce some antibiotics as well. Um, diagnosis, we're going to do physical exam, we're going to use uh, clinical signs and history to go off of. History especially, is the human sick? Has someone in the house had the flu lately? Um, because that can certainly contribute to the cat being sick then. There is a, a PCR test, uh, it's a polymerase chain reaction test. It detects RNA of the virus. Uh, it is an outside lab test, so that needs to be sent away. That can confirm presence of H1N1. And um, we'll use x-rays to check the condition of the lungs. Um, that can help to indicate if there's like a, you know, a pneumonia thing going on in there as well. Prognosis is the majority, uh, majority of patients, it's a good prognosis, but the flu can be fatal, especially, like we said, to the young, to the old, and to the... <laughs> Um, to the uh, immune compromised. And then is it zoonotic? Yes, people can catch the cat flu, this H1N1. So that's a nice and short one. Um, okay, so then let's talk about panleukopenia. Panleukopenia is... Um, it has a couple names. You'll also hear it called the feline viral enteritis and feline distemper. I don't really like the terminology on distemper, feline distemper, because I don't think that this illness really looks like um, canine distemper at all. So I don't know why they call it feline distemper. Um, anyways, the agent of panleukopenia is the feline parvovirus. Um, so we're familiar with a, another parvovirus, the canine parvovirus, and you'll see that this one can be kind of similar as well. Incubation time on panleukopenia is two to seven days. Transmission, it can be transmitted from aerosolized secretions, uh, direct transmission, so direct contact with a sick animal. Um, it can be transmitted via vector or fomite if they come into contact with body secretions. It could um, transmit in utero as well from mother to babies. It is present, the virus is present in all bodily secretions. So the cat is just basically oozing um, panleukopenia virus. Uh, clinical disease rarely lasts um, more than five to seven days, but often because um, they die. 
So it's a, it's a short, shorter lived illness, but um, because they, they don't, don't make it beyond the, that like kind of week long timeline. Systems affected the GI tract and the bone marrow, the reproductive system, the central nervous system, the ophthalmic system, or well, the eyes. Uh, clinical signs, uh, we're gonna see immune suppression. So the very name of the illness indicates that, right? Pan leukopenia. So penia, we remember, is um, a term that we use in the blood. Like it's like a suffix that we use when we're referring to blood. And it is um, a decrease or insufficiency. Uh, leuco is white and pan is all, right? So all white blood cells are low. Um, so that makes sense when we have immune suppression, when those white blood cells are severely low. And that's because that bone marrow is affected, right? Uh, remember that the bone marrow is responsible for making all our blood cells. Uh, we can see secondary bacterial sepsis, same as with parvo uh, in canines. We'll see vomiting and diarrhea um, and therefore dehydration. We'll see depression and anorexia and sudden death as well. Is it debilitating? It can be anywhere between subclinical and severe. In the young cats, though, we're more likely to see it severe. Um, the virus is shedding um, all throughout the actual disease. And uh, in some survivors, it can be up to six weeks longer in the urine and the feces. Treatment. Can we treat a virus directly? Nope. So we're going to offer supportive treatment. Uh, there isn't anything we can do for central nervous system signs, uh, but we can give them an IV, um, like IV fluids to help with the dehydration, antibiotics for that secondary bacterial sepsis. We can give them pain medications, anti-nausea, et cetera. So we're just basically treating um, the clinical signs with the supportive therapy. Is there a vaccine? Yes, and it's core vaccine. It is the P in FVRCP. Uh, so it's FVR, feline, viral, rhinotracheitis. C is Khaleesi virus. P is panleukopenia. So uh, timeline uh, for vaccines on this one is 8, 12, and 16 weeks, one year, and every one to two years thereafter. Uh, for kittens, if they're infected in utero, so before they're born, they will typically abort. Oh, sorry, I gotta scroll down here. Um, so they will they will die before they are born, um, or they could have cerebellar hypoplasia. I'm not sure if you remember talking about this when we talked about A and P. Uh, the cerebellum, remember, is the part of the brain that's responsible for. Uh, balance and um, like mobility, kind of those gross motor skills. Uh, so in cats that have cerebellar hypoplasia, uh, hypo is deficient and plasia is referring to growth. Um, so the cerebellum is quite a lot smaller than it's supposed to be. So these kittens have issues with walking. Um, they're really shaky and wobbly. Um, they're, they're like a high needs, special needs kitten to uh, take care of. Um, they could have uh, intention tremors and blindness as well. Um, all things um, caused by that bacteria in, in such a young body system. Or not bacteria, sorry, virus in such a young body system. Is there reoccurrence? No, once the animal has had it, it is immune if it manages to survive. Diagnosis, we can run a blood test and we'll see extremely low white blood cells. We can use a canine parvo snap test um, that can give us a positive result for a feline parvo virus as well. There are antibody testing we can send to outside labs. And of course, we're gonna base things on clinical signs, history and physical exam. Uh, a young kitten with um, low blood cells or low white blood cells, vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration, I'm assuming, um, and, and unvaccinated, I'm going to assume panleukopenia. Uh, prognosis is guarded to moderate. So the mortality rate is 50%. 
But if the cat is able to, or well, kitten is able to survive till day five of being sick, they are likely to live through the illness, which is kind of nice for them. Uh, environment wise, it does survive well. It survives freezing. Um, so it's fairly hardy in our Manitoba um, winters. But bleach and um, accelerated hydrogen peroxide will kill this virus. And is it zoonotic? No, thank goodness. Okay, and our last one for today is cat scratch fever. It's abbreviated CSD and it's caused, oh, sorry. Um, and it is, uh, another name for it is Bartonellosis. Uh, so it is caused by the uh, Bartonella hensile bacteria. Um, it is transmitted to humans via cat bites, cat scratches, and cats licking your open wounds. So this is one of those illnesses that we talk about, not because it's really bad for cats, but because it's really bad for humans, because this is a zoonotic one. So you'll see clinical signs for cats, the vast majority are gonna have no clinical signs. The few that do, it's really um, fairly rare and it's gonna be mild and transient. 40% uh, of cats are positive for this illness at some point during their life, okay? So it's fairly common in cats, um, but it is not common that they actually show signs of being sick. So for humans, at about 7 to 12 days post cat bite, cat bite or scratch, you're going to see a swelling or abscess at the injury site. Uh, 14 to 23 days post bite, right, post bite or scratch, we're going to see swollen lymph nodes, flu symptoms, and that swelling will persist for a few weeks. Um, most people do recover in a few weeks, uh, so about 90% will resolve without treatment or antibiotics. Um, if the person does need treatment, it'll be more of a supportive treatment and antibiotics. So azithromycin is the or antibiotic of choice, and you need to take that for about three weeks. Uh, you may or may not need the lymph nodes drained as well. Uh, so vaccine, no, there's no cat vaccine for, um, cat scratch fever. Uh, how is it diagnosed? In, uh, cats, we can do a blood culture or tissue culture, for instance, a lymph node biopsy. In humans, there is a cat scratch disease skin test, which determines whether or not you've been infected. Uh, prognosis for cats is really great because like usually they don't even show signs that they're sick. In humans, um, the prognosis is fairly good unless uh, the person is young, old, or immunocompromised. Those people are more likely to have more severe illness. Um, and then, oh, what are we on here? Prevention. So, um, well, we can't really do too, too much for our cats besides flea control. Uh, fleas can spread around that Bart Bartonella. So if we have flea control for our cats, then in theory that keeps them healthier. Um, we, for our cells, we can do hand hygiene, right? Just making sure we're washing our hands really well, especially if you've been bit or scratched. Um, you should wash your hands. After a cat bite, you should wash your hands and while letting it actively bleed for like 15 minutes. Um, same with scratches. Honestly, you should really have uh, washed the scratches really well and washed them for a long time and let them bleed. The more it bleeds, like bleeding helps to clean out the wound, right? It, let, it kind of pushes all that bacteria out. Hopefully that's the theory. Um, we want to prevent cats from licking any open wounds that we have but there is no vaccine, so we can't really do anything that in terms of vaccinating to prevent. Um, so it is, okay, so it is possible to give cats antibiotics to in theory decrease the level of um, this bacteria, but there's no solid evidence that it actually increase or decreases the probability of infection for the owner. 
Um, so I, that's something that was kind of being tossed around is like, we'll just give them a round of antibiotics here or there to kind of bring those levels down. Um, but that is not in line with um, the new antibiotic recommendations in terms of um, antimicrobial stewardship. So remember that, oh, actually, I'm not sure if we talked about that. Um, antimicrobial stewardship is basically saying don't use antibiotics unless there's a clear need. So um, giving cats antibiotics here or there to, in theory, decrease the potential of infection for humans is not considered um, a reasonable reason to use antibiotics because it's not proven. So why would we do it? And then is cat scratch fever zoonotic? Um, yeah. It is, yeah. That's why we're talking about it. It's very zoonotic. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, indoor cats. So people will often say, oh, my cat doesn't go outside. My cat doesn't need any vaccines. That's silly. So they'll often get their cat vaccinated as kittens, but never get any boosters as adults. So we know that cats and dogs need boosters because... While those memory cells will last a few years, they do not last forever. Um, so we need to booster to create new memory cells so that if the animal is exposed to these illnesses again, that they will be protected. Um, so we want to talk to owners about getting certain vaccines for indoor cats. Yes, I will acknowledge they do not need every single possible vaccine. Um, we still have a couple more illnesses that we'll talk about tomorrow that do have um, vaccines available, but they're like non-core. But definitely those core, um, those core illnesses that are in the core vaccine, what do we remember about them? So feline herpes virus, the FVR, feline viral rhinotracheitis. Um, how can it be transmitted? Via fomites, i.e. your shoes via vector, right? Same with Khaleesi virus, can be transmitted by fomites and vectors. So you can bring those things home with you, right? Um, I'm just looking for my panleukopenia. Panleukopenia, fomites, and vectors. So at all three viruses that the FVRCP vaccine protects for can be transmitted via fomite. So even if your cat never leaves the house, you could be bringing it home to your cat, which is a terrible gift to bring home. So we should vaccinate all cats, indoor or otherwise, for um, FVRCP, the, so the main core vaccine. Uh, so they are all tr transmittable via fomites. Um, panleukopenia, um, what did we say? 90% of cats die and it's very costly to treat if your cat does get it. That's not great. That's pretty severe illness. We should be vaccinating against that. Um, and then rhinotracheitis and Khaleesi virus, it is possible to become lifelong carriers with ongoing flare-ups. That's not great. So if we can prevent that, why wouldn't we? Why would we, why would we let our cat get sick if we could prevent it, right? Um, and of course, if the cat ever escapes, uh, I don't know about your cats, but my cat's constantly trying to get out the door. If your cat escapes, you don't know who they've been around or what they've been exposed to. Um, so it's a good idea to keep them protected by keeping them vaccinated. And uh, rabies. So we're not going to talk about rabies again when talking about cats. It's all the same information for cats as for dogs. We're going to give a vaccine at 16 weeks and one year and then booster it every one to three years. Um, and we want to use rabies vaccine for even indoor cats because rabies is such an extreme virus. It is very zoonotic. It's extremely fatal once clinical signs develop. And um, it's really inconvenient if your unvaccinated for rabies cat bites someone, you need to have them quarantined for six months. And when we're talking about quarantine for a rabies bite, we're not talking about how we are all quarantined right now for COVID, right? Um, we're talking you need to pay to have your cat housed um, at a vet clinic, or if you have a dog, it's housed either at a vet clinic or at um, animal services, and it needs to stay there for six months. So that means that you don't have contact with your cat either, 
It's locked up in a kennel for six months. That's terrible. Who wants that for their pet? And then, of course, I always remind people as well that in the city of Winnipeg, rabies vaccine is a bylaw. All pets living, all cats and dogs pets living in the city of Winnipeg, by law, have to be up to date on their rabies vaccines. So that's if that's not good enough incentive for you, then um, I don't really know what. So let's talk a little bit quickly about a possible side effect that can happen in cats from vaccines. We talked about in our first unit, um, mild vaccine side effects. So some examples would be mild lethargy, mild fever, a uh, small amount of pain at the site of injection. Cats, however, can get something, um, I don't know if you want to call it special, but it's certainly different and that's a post-vaccination sarcoma. A sarcoma is a cancer. It's a cancer of connective tissues. So what can happen is that the fibrous connective tissues under the skin um, are involved in this, um, in this cancerous site and they become fibrosarcomas. So it happens in genetically susceptible cats um, and it seems that there's some kind of component of the vaccine that triggers a prolonged and intense inflammatory reaction that eventually becomes a sarcoma. Um, so it doesn't happen in all cats, but it can happen in cats. They honestly don't really know what is causing it, um, besides that it seems like there's um, a genetic kind of component in there. So the number of cats that are affected by post-vaccination sarcoma is really, really small, but it's really severe when um, they are affected because basically you give them a vaccine intending to keep them healthy and then they get cancer, which is not cool. Uh, so what we end up seeing is a single firm lump under the skin at the vaccine site that persists beyond three months. Um, little lumps less than three months are usually just a local response to the vaccine and usually they last up to that three month mark. Anything hanging around longer than that, we're going to start suspecting this post vaccine sarcoma. How can we diagnose this? We're going to need to do a biopsy to diagnose it. Uh, so we can um, take uh, either a small piece of the um, of the sarcoma and send it away for testing or we can just remove the whole sarcoma. And just look, I should have had this ready, but I'm just logging into my drive to show you some pictures here. Uh, so how do we treat a vaccine sarcoma? We need to remove it. And we need to remove it with really generous margins. So generous margins means that we take a lot of area around the um, lump itself to make sure that we're getting everything. Um, this, this reduces the likelihood of recurrence. If we don't take away everything, then we are likely to um, have, uh, have it redevelop if we leave any cancer cells. So depending on the size or position of the tumor, limb amputation may be necessary. So here, I'm just going to show you some pictures here. So if you just give a vaccine into this like kind of scruff area between the shoulder blades, um, you are going to have to have these huge margins. Okay, so this is the sarcoma lump. This is the margins they're taking. So basically, they're kind of just taking out the whole cat. Look how much like incision. This is a huge incision. Like this is insane. How is this poor cat going to recover from this, right? Um, so one thing that we can do is to vaccinate over the limbs. If we're vaccinating up here, yeah, we're just doing a catectomy to remove that lump. It's way too much that's getting removed. If we vaccinate back here over the hips, again, you're going to have to like take out the whole cat to try to get rid of that. So to prevent, we want to vac, well, it's not prevent, it's to be proactive so that if there is an issue of a sarcoma, we could do a limb amputation as opposed to like a cat back amputation. So we can vaccinate over the limbs or on the tail. Uh, so these right here over the hip, over the shoulders, those are the most common sites of post-vaccination sarcoma. 
So we wanna to try to vaccinate over the limbs. So there's a few different types of prevention that we can use. We can avoid unnecessary vaccinations. So we wanna vaccinate cats the minimum amount that we can. So if it's a vaccine that's good for three years, we're gonna give it once every three years. We're not gonna give them non-core vaccines that they're not at risk of contracting. We're going to just give the, um, the core, core vaccines and any non-core that is um, applicable to their lifestyle. If possible, we'd like to use live vaccines uh, because they have less um, um, at, uh, attenuance. So those um, can cause more reaction, right? Um, we want to vaccinate on the limbs or the tail. Uh, so you can vaccinate anywhere that you can make a little um, skin tent uh, and you can vaccinate on the tail. I'm kind of like, good luck. There's this one doctor that I worked with that was always saying how we should be vaccinating on the tails. It's pretty tricky because um, if you've ever seen a cat, their tails are always on the move, especially at the vet because they're so irritated. But if we are able to vaccinate over a limb or over the tail, if a tumor does develop, we can just amputate that limb or tail and we don't have to worry about um, those huge margins and possible um, uh, regeneration of the tumor. We really want to make sure, actively make sure that we are avoiding using the scruff to administer those injections. Um, those scruff tumors, I mean, you can see the picture there, right? It's really deep rooted. They can get really big and they can be really difficult to fully remove from this area. Case in point, like look at this surgery, this poor cat. So um, that's something that we should definitely be uh, aware of is that post-vaccination sarcoma. So like I said, really um, pretty rare occurrence, but it is an extreme uh, occurrence when it does happen. Uh, okay, so that's everything I wanted to talk about then for today's material. We do have some more illnesses to discuss, but we can go over those ones tomorrow. Um, if you have any questions, make sure you ask in the chat, email me, or uh, ask in the virtual classroom. Thanks so much for listening. Bye.